Um, so my talk tonight um, is, I think it's called The Path and the Goal. And um, it is leading on from the series that we've been doing on the Wheel of Life. We've spent a, a series like a really wonderful length of time looking at the Wheel of Life. And this really rich and very teaching, which is at, it's at times really stark and uncompromising, tells it how it is. Um, and it shows how we just go round and round in the dissatisfaction of samsara. But we also learned how to get off. We learned how to get off out of the wheel of life and those endless cycles of unskillful behavior. We've seen how to get off the wheel. And Vidanya mapped out really beautifully last week the ways that we can get off the wheel and onto the spirals. So we've seen how to get off the wheel, onto the spirals, what we, you know, we learned that there are several different ways to do that into more open, kinder, wiser, more spacious, more generous ways of being. And eventually opening up to enlightenment itself. And at the end of that spiral is Buddhahood. At the end of that spiral, the Buddha is there at the end of the spiral path. And the Buddha is our ultimate role model, you know, in how to do that, how to get off the wheel, onto the spiral, up, you know, to enlightenment itself. Or some people say down to enlightenment itself, whichever way you go, whichever way you think about it. Um, so we can use, in a strange kind of way, it's like a really beautiful circle. We can use the Buddha, the stories of the Buddha's enlightenment, the stories of the unfolding of his, his enlightenment experience um, to help us in our, in our training, to help us in our path. So this talk is about the Buddha's enlightenment, the, the things that happen during it, some of them, not all of them, and how we can really take heart from it and learn from it. We can learn the symbols of, um, of the things that happened during that experience and um, apply them to our own practice. The, Buddha, the Puja says, what the Buddha attained, we too can attain. What the Buddha overcame, we too can overcome. So we're going to look at the events during his enlightenment and see how we can apply them to our life. And as I was re as I was writing the talk, I was like, God, it is actually amazing. And I'm not just saying that, you know, to to, to kind of zhuzh my talk. I'm act I actually really mean it. I was so amazed to see that exactly the same things that the Buddha struggled with on the verge of enlightenment are exactly the same things that I struggle with so far from enlightenment and I always kind of had this feeling that he was so far away you know so far away from me but actually when you look at what he went through in that night when he became enlightened it's really interesting it's not that far away so well in one way so he the Buddha left home as we know he were left home on his quest and he went to, he was out on his quest looking for, to solve the problem of old age, sickness and death. And after seven years of extreme practices, he realized that he'd got absolutely no further on. Um, but then a, a great kind of inspiration came over him and he just kind of decided, well, that is it, Avada. He just said, here on this seat under the Bodhi tree, got, he got a comfy, pile of grass, <laughs> sat under the tree and said, here on this seat, my body may shrivel up. Here, my skin, my bones, my flesh may all dissolve, but I will not move my body from the seat until I have reached final and complete enlightenment. So hard to achieve in the course of ages. So that's what he did. He got to the point where nothing was going to hold him back. And so, of course, what happens then is Mara pops up. So Mara, who is this Mara that pops up right at this moment? So Mara is the his his kingdom is samsara. His kingdom is is the wheel of life, um, and he's that little voice that undermines us. Um, so we can think of him as the personification of anything in our own mind that holds us back, anything that undermines us, that little voice that says, you can't do it. Anything that holds us back from our quest, at whatever stage he pops up. And if we start making progress, Mara pops up. 
Um, and he can be, uh, we can imagine them as a real person of any gender. We can imagine him as forces deep within our own mind. We, it's whatever sows the seed of doubt in our minds that's, that makes us doubt that we can grow and change. And so he always pops up at that point. So for our purposes, for um, listening, for, for working with the story, um, it's a, it, it, Mara is a him. And he's a, a kind of sneaky character. He's an underminer. And um, he represents the forces deep in Siddhartha's mind. So right the way through the story until he achieves enlightenment, you know, he's still Siddhartha Gautama. He's still the, the um, practicing you know, just still trying to gain enlightenment. So, you know, he's not the Buddha until, until the end. So the first tactic Mara employs is to try and make Siddhartha ashamed. And so that kind of shows that he must have had, this must have been in the Buddha's mind somewhere for Mara to have found it. Mara says, this life of a beggar should make you ashamed. Stand up. You're a warrior prince. You're a member of the noble caste of the Kshatriya warriors. Follow your caste duty. You know, we haven't got any warrior princes, I don't think, but um, that kind of makes me think, well, oh God, yeah, you know, I have felt a bit embarrassed sometimes about coming out as a Buddhist, about sitting under my tree. You know, perhaps ex family expectations of what my life should be at this time in my life, um, based on the expectations of family and friends. You know, maybe there's people who in, in my life who think my, you know, that my uh, attempts at trying to have a life of simplicity and doing as little as possible, um, do I fear that? Do I worry about what they might think? Morris says, leave this cowardly quest and go back to the way things were before. And that's what Mara is saying to the Buddha, to Siddhartha. So do, do we ever have that voice? Do we ever have, you know, am I doing the right thing? Should I be going back to the way things were before? And it is confusing. It is confusing. I, I find it very confusing because we're, uh, we're kind of, we have a duty to follow our highest ideals, don't we? But we also have, we feel or think, and sometimes we have duties to follow family expectations. So that, that can be a tension for us in our life. That, that, um, and there aren't any answers, really. We just have to keep looking at that. It also makes me think of the times when I can feel a bit, um, a bit ashamed or embarrassed for standing up to what I really believe in. And I can collude with unskillful behavior for fear of what, you know? I don't know quite what, really. Um, you know, I have very strong conditioning and habits and patterns with my friends and family where there are certain expectations. And to stand outside of that is really quite hard. You know, it, it messes with the sense of who I am. It's quite difficult to change. Sometimes if I don't collude and if I don't laugh at the joke or if I don't agree, it's like there's this weird kind of unsaid thing that I'm judging them. I'm actually not at all, but because I'm not doing what I always did, it feels a little bit like that. It's so hard. And I think also there is the fear of being rejected from the group. And Mara knows this and he's right in there. It's just incredible to think that even the Buddha, even Siddhartha at that stage, there must have been a vestige left of fear of rejection from his clan from the Shakya clan, there must have been something there for Mara to say to him, get up, you're a warrior prince, what are you doing? Even the Buddha on the verge of enlightenment is, is having the same thing I have. And I, you know, in, in one way I think, God, I've got so long, such a long way to go. And then on another, and the other way I can think, oh God, yeah, actually, this is just human. It's very, very human. So it's about Mara kind of gets into that thing of do what you've always done and be who you always have been in the past. And that's that kind of fear of change. So then, you know, but Siddhartha didn't move. He didn't move a muscle, absolutely didn't move. Um, and when Mara shot his arrow, he did not flinch. So then Mara's like, that didn't work. 
So what next? So Mara has this the scariest army that you could possibly ever think of. The, uh, I'll just read you a couple of lines. It'd be really good to look up the story of his enlightenment and read this description of Mara's army. They're his sons. They're so scary. So this couple of lines, he, uh, Mara summoned the terrible hair-raising army of his sons. His soldiers could transform their shapes and faces in a million ways. Their heads and hands were twisted and distorted. Their eyes flamed, shining red and flashing, their teeth sticking out of their mouths, their tongues lolling thick and rough like matting. Um, but Siddhartha didn't move a muscle. Um, you know, he, he was still, still and quiet and completely unmoved and confident. So Mara was so desperate to, sit, to defeat Siddhartha. His, um, can we just imagine how scary that was? So he's in the forest, in the middle of the night, alone. And these are the fears that are besetting him, the fears in his own mind, the remaining forces of, of fear and hatred in his mind. And this is how scary it is. This is how scary it is for Siddhartha. He's sitting there with all these monsters and they are the scariest kind of monsters you can imagine attacking him with spears and rocks, with abuse. They're shouting at him and screaming at him. These monstrous figures are coming for him. How frightening that must have been. And so how frightened he must have been. But potentially the fear was yeah, the potential for fear was there. Mara was still, you know, he was, he was throwing all this stuff at Siddhartha. But again, Siddhartha did not move. It's really important for us that we see not to be frightened of these energies as they arise and to follow his example. You know, we're not special. He's not special. This is human. We all have it. To kind of see it as mental weather. It says the Buddha, uh, Siddhartha, um, saw them all like a magic show, like a dream, like clouds forming and reforming in the sky. To try and frighten him away from the tree of enlightenment was like trying to frighten the sky. That's oh, just so beautiful, isn't it? Can you imagine inside his aura? It's completely pure and still. And there's this gorgeous description of what's going on inside the Buddha's aura you could call it like inside the buddha's mind there's peacocks kind of going la, 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 <laughs> and there's flowers falling and the sun shining and it's all like la, 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 inside the aura and outside there's these monsters shouting at him and for the buddha for siddhartha it's just it's okay you know they're there he just notices it like a show just like a dream passing um, so how on earth do we train in this? You know, how can we see the comings and goings of the, all this stuff like mental weather? Well, we've just got to keep going. We've just got to keep doing the metabhavna. You know, the first step is to acknowledge that we have them, that we have these forces of hatred and fear in our minds, to acknowledge them, that we can transform them is the first step. And all the practices that we teach here and on going on retreat, help us to understand what's going on when these things arise for us. So, you know, we can see them and know them and acknowledge them and not be frightened away from our quest. We've got them, every human being has them. We don't have to be frightened of that. We can train in working to be just like the Buddha. So when they come up, we're okay with that. And we just carry on step by step doing all the things that we're doing coming to Sanganai, all that stuff. So no matter what Mara threw at him, Siddhartha remained still and the rocks and spears fell, as fell the rocks and, and spears of hatred and fear fell as flowers at his feet. So not different to us. Now, if we think we're special, you know, if we think only I've got all these forces of, of hatred and fear, no one's got hatred and fear like me. If we think we're special, then we can be frightened away from our quest. We know that Siddhartha had them too. So we don't have to be put off. You know, we can um, 
uh, all those negative emotions, all those fears, we can, uh, we don't have to worry about that. We just, we can transform, we can change them. It's not easy, but we just keep training. So then his armies didn't work. Trying to make the Buddha afraid of his own fear and hatred didn't work. So he sent his daughters in to entice the Buddha, to, to excite desire in Siddhartha. So his daughters were very, very beautiful and very available. <laughs> Spring is here, they say. The trees are in flower. The time is ripe for pleasure. Come, friend, let us enjoy ourselves. You are handsome. We are well-born and made for pleasure. Here of our own accord, driven by desire, only a fool, only a fool would resist such a pleasant, harmless invitation. And again, Siddhartha saw that sense desires cause more suffering because they never satisfy. So the daughters represent that feeling of wanting, wanting something that we think is going to make things better. Desire, craving, wanting. And how can we apply this to our own lives? Are we chasing that? Are we chasing these worldly pleasures? Are we chasing things and experiences and people to make our lives um, safer, I suppose? So the daughters represent these worldly pleasures, worldly things, worldly chasings that can hook us into a cycle of chasing the next thrill, the next whatever it might be. And the thing is, we're always going to be disappointed. And we can say, well, you know, my worldly pleasures are harmless. You know, they're harmless enough. Well, they might be. And they might keep us tied into a pleasure-seeking cycle that will leave us always needing more. And I find pleasures confusing as well. You know, because does that mean going for a lovely swim on a lovely evening that when I come out of the water, I think I feel so much better and I feel so much happier and I'm more well in myself? Does that count? Well, we have to work that out for ourselves. I don't know the answer to that. Does it, it, does it increase our craving? Does, does my pleasure, does my worldly pleasure help me be wiser, kinder, more grounded, more connected? Um, Sangharachita says something about this. He's talking about um, the wanting, you know, chasing and wanting the, 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 what the, the, the daughters represent. And he says, when you're in the grip of desire, it's hard to remember all of this. When you think you want something, well, you think you want it. You may need to go through the same procedure time and time again, maybe hundreds of times before you learn your lesson and accept that you're not going to get what you really want from that thing. It cannot give you real satisfaction, but it's difficult to keep, give up hoping that it might be able to and trying just one more time. I'll give it another chance before trying Nirvana. <laughs> and, and this sentence just really went in for me when I read it. I went, oh. <laughs> you, really, you have to really wallow in it before you know it's muck. Isn't that strong? Wow, that's really strong. What, so there's no answer. There is no, you know, the, the Buddha gave us answers to this, but how we apply that to our own lives are our worldly pleasures helping us on our path or are they holding us back? And that's something that we all have to work out for ourselves. It's a question that we can ask ourselves in the group. But the most important thing, um, oh no, I'll just tell you this as well. That even, so Sangrachta talked about the, the, the sublime pleasures of listening to the music of Bach. That, and even that, even how refined and how beautiful that is, gives them only an echo of the glimpse of the golden light of the Buddha. You know, the, the bliss of the Buddha. You know, he, he said, um, are, uh, are we getting pleasure from our practice? No, the, sorry, the Buddha said that if we could only see the, the pleasure of the freedom of heart was way better than any other worldly pleasure or anything that we might get from any other source, then we'd give up like that. We didn't actually do that, but you know, we'd, if we, he'd give, we'd give him up with that as a backward glance, but we don't quite believe it. The Buddha said that passionless is bliss. 
So, you know, that's something to think about. And, and the most important thing is that we are getting pleasure from our Dharma life, that our Dharma life is full. That's the most important thing, that we're having fun with our, with our practice, our meditation, our, the, our involvement in Sangha, our friendship, the rituals that we do, our study, going on retreat. This has got to be fun. It's got to be enjoyable. And if it's not, we've got to do something about that. So our worldly pleasures, if we can apply them to our practice, um, that, that's very, very important that we are having fun in our Dharma life. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. It has to be enjoyable. So in response to, his, to the daughters, the Buddha said, my pleasure is in the Dharma, in meditation, in the deathless, in love for others and in helping others. So here's the teaching. But little by little, you know, we need to really understand what we're doing, make that shift, trying to see um, having uh, it's for me, it's kind of making sure that my fun is um, has no harmful side effects. <laughs> That's really what we're looking at. And in fact, the opposite. So and another question to ask, where do we find our worldly pleasure? Is it feeding the cycle of wanting more and more and more that's never, never satisfying? Or are we looking for something that's more satisfying than that? So then Mara was eaten up with anger and envy. Nothing was working. And then he really went for it. So deep in the Buddha's mind, there must have been something. In Siddhartha's mind, there must have been something that made him feel like a bit of an imposter. There must have been something. Because then Mara says, what right have you, you upstart? <laughs> Being as you are a subject in my empire of desire, what right have you to defy your king? What right have you to sit on the diamond throne of the noble Buddhas, petty princeling that you are, and a traitor to your rightful ruler, meaning him? The Buddha just enveloped him in love and compassion. And he just touched the earth because he knew who had witnessed. He knew that there had been a witness all these years that could call, that he could call on that would say, yes, he has the right to sit on the diamond throne because I've witnessed all of his trials, all of his practice, all of these thousands and thousands of years. So he touches the earth and he calls upon the earth goddess. And she rises out of the earth. Very beautiful, you see often very beautiful pictures of this. And the earth goddess bows to the Buddha and says, yes, I have witnessed his practice over many thousands of lifetimes. I have witnessed that here now we have the rightful ruler to Siddhartha. And she bows to the Buddha. And terrified and broken, Mara and his armies and his daughters run away. So have we ever felt what right have I? Who am I to think I could ever be a part of this amazing Sangha? You know, everyone else seems so advanced. I'm so full of greed and hatred. I'll never be able to meditate. You know, we can just list them. I'll never change. I'm stuck like this. I'll never be able to tell anyone that dark thing about myself. I'll always be on the edge. I'll never have, never have such good friends as they all seem to have. My heart is like a stone. That was my big one. My heart is like a stone. I'm a fake. I'm useless, it's too hard. I'm, I'm not going back to the Buddhist center, it's too hard. If people really knew me, they'd throw me out. If people really knew me, they wouldn't want to be my friend. You know, these are all the ways that Mara can taunt us. Mara can say these things to us and they can, they can seem very, very real. So who can we call as our witness? when this happens, who do we call for our witness? The earth goddess, maybe. Maybe we just, when those thoughts come, we just say, I see you, Mara. I see you, Mara. I remember you saying that on Sangha night. <laughs> <laughs> Touch the earth. Touch the earth and call on the earth goddess. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe you have a connection with any of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Maybe the Buddha himself who did that very thing well, we see him touching the earth there. That's what he's doing. He's calling the earth goddess because he's got he had Siddhartha had that little vestige of doubt left. What right have I 
So he touches the earth and calls the earth goddess. That's what he's doing. So if we have that force, that's what we need to do. Maybe if, it's, if that's your thing. You know, I've seen you try. The Buddha will say, I've seen you try. I've seen you. Um, and I, you know, I've seen you work at it. Keep going. So sometimes, you know, like a, we can have a, a put a hand on your heart. You know, this kind of earth touching might not be, but you could touch your heart. Yeah, you know, I can do it. I might not be, I might not be able to be part of this amazing sangha now. I might not feel like I'm worthy or, or the wrong view we might have, but I'll just keep going. I'll just keep coming back, just like the Buddha did. I'll just keep coming back. We need something that makes us see that the Buddha also experienced this. Siddhartha. Siddhartha also experienced this and called the witness. And it's a bit like what that gorgeous thing that Vedanya said yesterday, last week, about the thread. You know, the thread of the Shraddha, the thread of faith that we pull from the future. It's a bit like that. We have to have some kind of thread that we pull from the future that will, you know, that's how it could be. I could be somebody who's part of this amazing Sangha, or whether if that's your thing. That was mine. That's why I got my name. Um, because that was, uh, uh, that th you might have your own personal take on your own doubt. But what we're talking about is doubt. And um, the next step will be kindness. Noticing that Mara is speaking to you. Noticing that your, the, our potential is real, that we can do it, and turning towards turning towards Mara, I see you, I see you. Call on your witness, pull that thread of Shraddha, and Mara will run away. So there was no more greed, there was no more hatred, there was no more doubt, no more desire, and Siddhartha began the final phase of his enlightenment experience. Just as the light of the morning star came into view, the great dark was ripped apart. And that's the bit where we all jump out of our skins in the Buddha Day Puja. You know, when the symbols clash, were you here for that? I did it this year and everyone went, wow! So the great dark was ripped apart. And in all directions a great splendor illumined all the realms of the universe and the world shook. And then the Buddha continued to absorb the enlightenment experience. He was an enlightened being. And it, you know, the, the world had turned inside out. The universe had turned inside out. And it took a really long time for him to absorb what had happened and time passed. And there are other aspects to the story that I'm not going to, haven't got time to talk about. But then we enter a really interesting part of the story, particularly interesting part of the story featuring Mucha Linda, the king of the Nagas. Of Nagas. So Nagas are a really important aspect of Buddhist practice. They're sort of deities that Nagas are huge, powerful, serpent-like creatures um, in the Buddhist tradition, and they live in the depths of the lakes and the oceans. They preside over the rivers and traditionally, and, and the lakes and the oceans. And traditionally, they're the keepers of the wisdom texts. So um, they, uh, they hold these texts and they're from the depths. Normally they live in gorgeous palaces at the bottom of the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean of our unconscious. So these, um, these Nagas are kind of an embodiment of, of, of what's actually in every human being. So they embody the positive, powerful forces in the depths of our being, forces that if we were in touch with, would support our highest ideals. And there's that thing from Marianne Wilson, I think it's, I can't remember, I should have looked it up, but you will all know it. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And this is what the Nagas are about. They hold for us all of this power and our task is to make them, make the Nagas more and more conscious. So, so that's a little bit about what the Nagas are. And sometime after the enlightenment, um, the Buddha, who was the Buddha now, was still sitting under a tree, a different tree. He'd moved to a different tree now, not the Bodhi tree, the Muchalinda tree. And he was enjoying the bliss of the continuing unfolding of the enlightenment experience. 
And part of the world is shaking and being turned inside out was that there was um, a huge storm. So a storm came and it wasn't just rain, it was wind one minute, cold the next, hot the next, um, really unseasonable and really, really heavy rain. And the Buddha didn't move, he sat very still uh, whilst this was going on. But the Nagas began to stir, the king of the Nagas began to stir. And thinking to protect the Lord from cold and heat, gadflies, mosquitoes, wind and sun, and the touch of creeping things, the king of the Nagas came up from the depths and coiled himself around the Buddha and stayed there with his hood over the Buddha's head in a canopy of protection. And that's um, a picture of that. And again, no fear, just look at that, wow. So no fear, this really scary dragon-like creature. So this is kind of perfect unity of, um, of the power of the Nagas um, and the gentleness and serenity of the Buddha. So there's, you'll see these statues everywhere throughout the Buddhist world. So perfectly controlled and directed power and strength. And then sometime after the rain stops and the Naga transforms into another form, a beautiful 16 year old youth, a young man. And that's interesting, isn't it? He's beautiful and gentle and bows to the Buddha. And that's such a contrast to the hair raising scariness of Mara's army. You know, similar power, similar power, but so different in its manifestation. So this, the Naga and the transformed young man, these, these, this, these two united, they represent the upsurge in power and energy of um, these forces of Mara's army transformed and refined and controlled. Here is power put to the service of the good. So this widely known image of the serene and peaceful Buddha is given its true dimension, but with the addition of um, Muchalinda. So in the enlightenment, enlightenment isn't just a mental event. Enlightenment is the total transformation of a human being's psychophysical organism. It's like an explosion. And um, I, I listened to a talk by Padma Vajra on this, and this bit is from him. It's like a total transformation um, of our, when, when, when we become enlightened, we will be totally transformed. Our psychophysical organism will be completely, will explode in a way. And what comes is a boundless liberation of all negative emotion, all the holding, all the blocks, all the restrictions, just gone. And can you imagine the release of energy of that? And this is what the Naga represents that controlled energy. Tremendous amount of release of energy. And this is represented by the storm and the rain and the disturbances. So if you are, we know that our energy is bound up and tight. We know that our energy is, is coarse. And can you imagine if we could activate and release and refine that energy, what we would break all bonds. We would be powerful, full of energy, in command of these deep forces, protected by the Naga, embodying and representing all these qualities. So what can we learn from this episode? So we probably know where our blocks are. We, we have blocked energy in our body and in our mind, this energy, we are an energy being, aren't we? We're an energy being, we're not just the material, we're more than that. Should have done that, shouldn't I? <laughs> we're, not, we're not just this, are we? And there are blocks in our energy that we sometimes are released through puja, in ritual, through mantra, going on retreats are the times when we are likely to have breakthroughs in, in the, these blocks. When we, when we meditate, it's helpful not just to be in our head, to bring our meditation down into the gut, into the whole body. So we're meditating from the tips of our toes to the roots of our hair. So we have a heart involved and our gut involved. When we're speaking, you know, one, one big way for me in releasing energy, I know I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, is being able to speak up, being able to speak truthfully, coming out in a way, being witnessed, 
and learning to, to how to speak skillfully from the heart causes a huge energy release for me. You know, if I'm able to say the difficult thing, to have that difficult conversation, you know, kind of going into that difficult conversation where there's been some kind of disharmony or you have to say something that's really hard to someone and you're trying to say it as skillfully as you can and you really want to and you're doing your best, so scary beforehand and you're kind of blocked and weird. But when you're in that conversation, the energy that's flowing, you can feel it. When you're actually saying the thing that you've been found hard to say, you can feel the energy being released and you go deeper. If, if it's from the heart and if, you, we've learned the, if we've learned the skills of how to say these things with love and, and following the Buddha's example of how and when to speak, um, which we can find out from our teachers, um, then the energy that comes from that, that, that's an example of what I mean about the release of energy when we're able to tap in to it and transform it into something positive and beautiful. And I just feel re- that comes about mainly in deep friendship. You know, one of the main features of our, of Tree Ratner, of our movement is friendship. And this is where we can really get in touch with our Nagas um, in that communication with each other in Sangha. I feel really proud that we have everything we need to tread the path of the Buddha, everything we need to get off the the, the wheel of life and get onto the spiral and to follow his example up the spiral all the way to Buddhahood itself. I just feel really proud and grateful that we have all of that. You know, the Buddha, grateful to the Buddha for leaving home in the first place on that painful quest, seven years of struggle and pain, and he discovered the truth. And he decided to teach. Amazing. And then we have Sangharajda, such a clear translator of the Dharma for us. And then we have Sheffield Sangha, all the people who've come together over the years from the very from its very beginnings. And we're going to celebrate that in September, September the 10th, 11th. <laughs> Get that in your diaries. We're going to have an expression of that gratitude on September the 11th. Gratitude that we have this amazing center and everything that goes on in it <coughs> that we can practice. We can't do it alone. You know, we have everything we need to get off the wheel, onto the spiral, all the way to enlightenment itself. And this is what the world needs. The world needs us to get enlightened. The world needs enlightened beings. So we have each other to do that with. So let's get on with it. Let's get enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the questions in the groups would be, you know, any of those things that came up, what came up for the Buddha, did have those things come up for you? Siddhartha, the Buddha never had any, any of that. <laughs> Siddhartha had all that trouble. 